Hello, I'm John O'Hara, and I'm the president of the Maryland Group Against Smokers Pollution. Um, we were formed in 1975 to try to get smoke-free air here in Maryland, in the workplace, and also in public places. And we finally achieved that in 2007. Uh, our organization has about a thousand members out there scattered across the state of Maryland. And our biggest problem today is smoking in multi-unit housing, in condominiums, apartment buildings, and so on. And uh, that's the topic that uh, Dr. Rapace is going to be addressing tonight. Well, I'm Bill Ali, and I am a retired federal employee. I'm a senior citizen, a former health activist, and I want to know about the topic once I heard you were going to talk about it, uh, because I may have to leave my home and live in the kind of dwellings where you've pointed out the danger. So I'm looking forward to what you have to say. Thank you, Bill. John? I'm uh, Jim Repace. I'm a physicist by training. I've uh, studied secondhand smoke uh, since uh, 1975, and I've published uh, more than 80 papers on secondhand smoke. Uh, I've been a uh, visiting assistant professor at the Tufts University School of Medicine in the Department of Public Health. And for the previous six years, I've been a consultant to the Stanford University Department of uh, Civil and Environmental Engineering uh, on studying secondhand smoke in casinos and in multi-unit dwellings. What I'd like to talk about uh, tonight is some of the issues that are surround secondhand smoke in multi-unit housing. I have a PowerPoint presentation uh, which talks about my research that deals with the complaints that people have had in these buildings and some of the policy issues that surround it. What we do know about multi-unit housing and secondhand smoke is that it's an emerging public health and welfare problem. Uh, their Surgeon General has said there's growing concern about the uh, health impact of secondhand smoke exposure in uh, multi-unit housing, and the, uh, as, as well as subsidized housing and public housing. And the California EPA, the uh, Air Resources Board, has stated that there are increasing numbers of non-smokers who are no longer willing to be forced to breathe a toxic air contaminant because a neighbor on a balcony or in the next apartment uh, decides that they want to smoke and they would like to be able to choose clean air in their own homes. Now everyone knows that smoking is bad for smokers. In fact, I think most smokers don't realize how toxic exposure to tobacco smoke is. For example, by the time the average smoker is seven years old, he or she is dead. Half of all smokers are dead by the age of 70, whereas 80, only 80% 80 of, uh, rather, 80% of non-smokers remain alive. Uh, the situation is even worse when they get to be 85 years of, old, of age, because there are uh, a third of non-smokers still alive, but only 8% of smokers. In other words, there are four times as many non-smokers alive at the age of 85 as there are smokers. That shows how toxic exposure to tobacco smoke is. Now, we do know that secondhand smoke, as regular tobacco smoke that goes into smokers, contains thousands of chemicals, of which 172 are known toxic substances. There is no safe level of exposure that has ever been defined, and the Surgeon General's reports have stated this for years, including the current 2014 report. My analysis of tobacco smoke shows that there are 67 cancer-causing chemicals in it. 47 of those chemicals are regulated by the federal government and other circumstances as hazardous wastes, and 30 three are regulated as ha hazardous air pollutants by the EPA. If you 
look at the chemicals that are regulated in the occupational workplace. Uh, there are organ-specific carcinogens <coughs> that are in tobacco smoke that are known to cause uh, cancer of the blood-forming organs, of the bladder, uh, of the lung, uh, of the brain, uh, and other organs of the body. In other words, there are many, many chemicals in tobacco smoke that not only smokers should want to be exposed to, but certainly non-smokers who are involuntarily exposed uh, don't want to be exposed to that. In addition to that, if you're exposed as a non-smoker to secondhand smoke, it contains many irritating chemicals, as most non-smokers are aware. There are 19 chemicals in the gases uh, that are in secondhand smoke that can cause irritation, headache, nausea, dizziness, fatigue, asthma, and neurological disturbances. Among these are well-known chemicals such as formaldehyde, acrolein, carbon monoxide. There are also 21 chemicals in the particles that can cause irritation and dizziness, nausea, sensory, and lung irritation, that is sensory is eye, nose, and throat, nerve damage, lethargy, and heart disturbances. Among these are lead, arsenic, phenol, and quinoline, among many others. Now, the average smoker smokes two cigarettes an hour, and a chain smoker can smoke four times that much. A single smoker in an apartment can smoke up to uh, from 4,000 to more than 35,000 cigarettes per year, contaminating his own apartment or her own apartment, and as well as neighboring apartments with secondhand and thirdhand smoke. Now, a major problem is that apartments are not designed to contain air pollution. The California Energy Commission has stated very clearly there is leakage from individual apartments to or from the outdoors. There is leakage from one apartment to another. And there is interaction between the whole building leakage and an apartment to apartment leakage. That is, one apartment can affect another. Even opening a window in one apartment can change the airflow into or out of every other apartment or floor in the building. Now, what are the mechanisms by which to tobacco smoke can travel from a smoker's apartment to a non-smoker's apartment? Well, it travels on the air currents. Cigarette smoke travels from unit to unit driven by pressure differences between apartments from spaces where there are higher pressure to spaces of lower pressure through holes in the walls, the ceilings, the floors, the ventilation systems, the electrical outlets, the plumbing openings, and cracks around the doors and into corridors. If a smoker's apartment is under negative pressure with respect to the other apartments, then air will flow into the smoker's apartment. If it's under positive pressure relative to other apartments, then air will flow out of it. And if the pressure difference is the same, it, the smoke can go either way. So if you look at what the engineers and architects know about airflows in buildings, we know there are three kinds of things that go on. One is that pressure differences caused by wind on the outside of a structure can cause a, an overpressure on the windward side of the building and a, uh, uh, a partial vacuum on the leeward side of the building so that air will flow horizontally through the structure. We also know that uh, cooler air will come into the lower floors of a building and flow upward via the chimney effect to the upper floors of the building. So air can flow vertically in a structure as well. And we also know that if mechanical equipment such as exhaust fans uh, can, uh, in the bathroom or in the kitchen are operated, they can create a negative pressure in one apartment relative to another. So there are three mechanisms by which pressure differences can occur uh, in the chambers of a multi-unit uh, house or apartment building. Now, air flows in buildings were studied by the Center for uh, Environment 
and uh, energy in Minnesota and they studied five different buildings and you can see pictures of them here on your screen uh, and this slide shows uh, their buildings that they investigated to determine how much air infiltrated between neighboring apartments and whether sealing and additional ventilation measures could control the level of uh, secondhand smoke infiltration into non-smokers apartments. And what they found was very interesting that they could seal and ventilate apartments to try to control secondhand smoke but they only succeeded in being able to reduce by an average of about 25 percent the air flows from one apartment to another and another very interesting thing that they discovered that of the buildings that they studied, 8% of the units had as much as a quarter to 70% of their air, which was coming from another apartment. So in other words, uh, there are a minority of apartments where a great deal of the air in one unit is coming from another unit. And if there is smoke on, in that unit that is coming from, you're going to get an awful lot of it in your apartment. Now, it is of great interest to determine uh, how big the secondhand smoke infiltration problem is in multi-unit housing. We know there are 34 million occupied multi-unit buildings uh, in the United States whose median year construction was 1974. Uh, and the Centers for Disease Control has determined that there are 28 million U.S. residents with smoke-free home rules who have experienced secondhand smoke infiltration in their apartments each year. So there are 28 million people who are getting smoke from other units in their building. And some of them are also getting smoke from other units' balconies as well. Now, Secondhand smoke infiltration is not just a U.S. problem. There are uh, other countries that have studied secondhand smoke infiltration, particularly in Canada, where 46% of uh, Canadian residents studied who lived in apartments reported secondhand smoke infiltration, and 27% of those complained of symptoms. In a Danish study, 22% of the Danish apartment dwellers reported that secondhand smoke infiltrated their apartments. Uh, I have recently gotten some inquiries from London as well, which suggests it's a big problem in England uh, uh, in addition to that. Now, I've conducted my own study of secondhand smoke infiltration in 10 states uh, around this country. and uh, in, people have come to me with complaints. These are all complaint units. Three of these places uh, were commercial uh, buildings and they were people who had infiltration from uh, restaurants and bars in their mall or particularly cigar bars. Uh, I'm not going to talk about those. I'm going to talk about the 41 uh, residents in 10 different states who had infiltration in uh, coming in from other smokers, uh, from smokers' apartments into their own non-smoking apartment. And uh, these are pictures of these buildings in the various states. Uh, in California, uh, Tennessee, Utah, Colorado, Florida, Virginia, District of Columbia, Maryland, New Jersey, New York, uh, and Massachusetts. And here, here are some more pictures of these various buildings. Uh, we even had problems in Washington, D.C. in the Watergate. Uh, there was no difference. We, I've seen problems that uh, occurred from secondhand smoke infiltration in high-rise high uh, penthouse apartments in Manhattan and in low-rise uh, buildings in, uh, for subsidized housing in Massachusetts. Uh, they know no economic level and uh, 
smokers, uh, non-smokers of every stripe have experienced infiltration and many have gotten sick from it. Now, every complaint that I have gotten has been confirmed by the presence of nicotine using one of these passive nicotine monitors. You simply hang it up in the room where the smoke is being uh, uh, experienced and it, it diffuses in through this and reacts with the filter paper that's on the inside and it's later analyzed by gas chromatography and mass spectrometry. And in all of these places where we have confirmed nicotine infiltration, uh, we, their clients have reported coughing, sneezing, difficulty breathing, bronchitis, asthma aggravation, eye, nose and throat irritation, headache, dizziness, nausea, fatigue, or heart palpitations. These are rather uh, severe in many people and they're certainly a nuisance for most. In their own words, uh, secondhand smoke infiltration is intolerable. It's affecting my health and my ability to function. I can't bear to be in my own home. I developed a cough I couldn't get rid of. Smoke causes headaches, difficulty in breathing and malaise. I collapsed twice from secondhand smoke exposure. I was unable to use my space normally for any purpose. Worst symptoms are headaches lasting for hours. My home has become uninhabitable. I have to wear a face mask the entire time I'm in my apartment. I have itchy, watery eyes, throat constriction, cough, and bronchospasm. I've developed reactive airways disease, vocal cord closure. I use emergency inhalers. I have choking, nausea, sore throat, and airway irritation. Or I take cough medicine constantly. I've lost my health insurance because I can't work my business full time. Those are reports taken verbatim from the self-reports of just 13 of my 41 clients. And when I compiled the symptoms that these people have reported, uh, I found that the most common report was asthma aggravation uh, and breathing difficulty. Second most common was coughing. Uh, third most common was malodors or nuisance. Fourth was headache and so forth and so on. And it goes right down the list. So there were a lot of severe uh, reports. I'd like to talk about a very current one that I've just done in recently for an elderly woman who lived in subsidized housing in Massachusetts. She's disabled. She suffers from asthma from lung disease, from cardiac disease. Uh, she was threatened with eviction for simply complaining about secondhand smoke infiltration in her apartment, although she ostensibly was supposed to live in a smoke-free building, and which they're not enforcing. She's filed a complaint with the Department of Housing and Urban Development, which is being uh, adjudicated at the present time. So municipalities and housing authorities uh, with multi-unit housing smoking bans uh, are rare. Of the 36,011 U.S. municipalities, only 17 in the entire country, or 0.05%, ban smoking in market rate multi-unit housing and 55 or 0.15 percent have partial bans and all of those are in the state of California. Now around the country uh, there are 180 U.S. municipal public or affordable housing authorities in 32 states uh, and they have a much better record. 128 of the 180 or 71 percent ban smoking entirely although, as I've mentioned, not all of them are enforcing it, and 52 of those have partial smoking bans. So the housing authorities are doing a much, much better job than the uh, private sector is. Now, what are the conclusions that we can draw about this? Secondhand smoke infiltration affects 28 million non-smoking apartment dwellers around the country. We know that this occurs because of interunit pressure differences that drive infiltration. And we know that 
the symptoms that these people are experiencing, these non-smokers in their own homes, are breathing difficulty, coughing, sneezing, eye, nose, and throat irritation, headaches, dizziness, nausea, uh, or bad odor. We know that secondhand smoke causes lung and breast cancer. We know it causes heart disease and asthma. We know from the Surgeon General's reports that there is no known safe level of exposure to secondhand smoke. We have around the country 100% smoking bans in workplaces, restaurants, and bars that protect 49% of the U.S. population. However, the population that resides in their apartments is protected less than 1%. So it is very clear to me that smoke-free multi-unit housing laws are desperately needed by the population of apartment dwellers to urgently to protect their health and their welfare uh, and including the welfare of, the, of their children. So I'd like to throw this open for a discussion with our other guests here. Uh, in to talk about their own experiences and their expectations. John? Well, uh, of course, I live in a private home, and so um, we're not affected by tobacco smoke. But uh, as I pointed out, uh, I'm the president of the Maryland Group Against Smokers Pollution. And at the moment, that is our biggest complaint from our members. We have had one woman who said that she frequently has had to go down and spend the night in her car because the smoking was so bad in her apartment, the secondhand smoke coming into her apartment where she is a non-smoker. We have another woman who is a, uh, one of our members who said that she had her own business in her apartment building. Th these people incidentally own their own homes. I mean, it's, it's not like they're renting or anything. They, they literally own their own homes. And uh, she said because of the smoke infiltrating into her apartment, she could not conduct her business in, in, in her home there. Uh, and she had to, had to move, move it out of, the, out of the apartment there where she lived. Uh, these are the kinds of things that, these are really affecting these people in a real way. It's not some hypothetical thing or <coughs> some just a, a basic nuisance. We had another woman who had a heart attack and she, contends that, that the, the secondhand smoke infiltrating her apartment was the cause of her heart attack. And as a matter of fact, she even has all kinds of things from her doctor saying that she shouldn't be exposed to tobacco smoke in any way, shape, or form. And yet she's still suffering from it in her apartment. So it is a very, very real world problem for people out there. Yes, what has your experience been with the uh, state legislature trying to uh, cope with this problem. They've had hearings in Annapolis. It, it, it hasn't been, it, it's been terrible, Jim. I mean, we have had legislation introduced for the last three legislative sessions here in the state of Maryland. And we've never been able to get the bills out of committee. And, and I think that most of the people on these committees, they just don't realize just how, these people are impacted, and they need to see the kind of presentation you just gave this evening. Maybe that would sway some of them. And they also need to get in contact, or the people who are having these problems need to get in contact with their legislators in order to let them know how severely that's affecting yeah. them. And another thing you mentioned, Jim, was the children in, in some of these places. I mean, in a lot of these apartment buildings, I mean, you have young children living in those things, and you probably well know as well as I do that when that stuff starts getting into your body, especially if it's a, if it's a young child or an infant, when the, the body is being created, the central nervous system is being created and so on and so forth, tobacco can really cause terrific problems for people like that. Right, that's correct, John. In fact, there has been a national study by the Centers for Disease Control that looked at cotinine, which is a nicotine metabolite, in the uh, blood of children who lived in private homes and the blood of children who live in apartment houses. And they found that the children who lived in apartment houses, who are all obviously all non-smokers, have higher, 45% higher cotinine levels 
in their blood than the children who live in private homes. And clearly, this is coming from secondhand smoke infiltration into their units. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's a, just a terrible problem. Uh, the California experience, I think, has been instructive that it started at the city level, at the municipal level, where it's a lot easier to get city council members to yeah. pay attention. Uh, and I recall that here in Maryland, when we started out uh, trying to get smoking sections in restaurants, uh, you know, getting it at the local level, the county level, uh, was, was the preferred method. So I, th I think perhaps the state uh, legislatures are, are going to be a hard call at this point and that perhaps uh, at the municipal level in states other than California uh, is probably the, the way to go. Do you have a comment, Bill? Uh, yes, uh, because I'm a senior citizen living in my own home, I have to decide for my future whether I want to move out of a private house and into a multi-unit, perhaps, uh, a type of uh, facility. Uh, hearing about the uh, poor record of legislators uh, wanting to make laws to protect me uh, makes me think that perhaps one of the best things for people like me is the uh, aging in place movement where I can stay in my own house and if I ever do want to go into some other uh, unit find out is it in a place, a jurisdiction that will give me protection or uh, wh whether the jurisdiction may not have anything in place but what the actual management is doing to protect me. So that puts a new element into planning for retirement right. for the growing number yeah. of senior citizens in our country. Yeah, I think there is a tremendous unmet demand for smoke-free housing in this country. And in fact, I gave an interview to the New York Times a few years ago and I said, I simply do not understand why it isn't being met uh, voluntarily. Obviously, there are buildings uh, particularly luxury buildings in New York and Washington, which are going up smoke-free. But around the country, this is not happening at, at, at any pace that's going to meet the de unmet demand. And it's sort of sad. And if you are in a, a situation where you own your own condominium, or even if you're a renter, uh, and you, wanna, you find that your smoke is coming into your apartment, and you simply decide to move, you can move into another situation that is absolutely identical. In fact, I have a client right now who is in exactly that boat, uh, an older couple. They lived in Pikesville, Maryland, and they moved from another part of Maryland into their present house. And it is, uh, their new uh, unit is simply all full of smoke. Some non-smokers have decided that they were going to sue uh, and uh, because they have no other option. And if you can afford it, that may be the only way you can get relief. But for most of us, it's too expensive. Yes. Well, Jim, you, you talked about the legislation, and one of the reasons why we've been so unsuccessful with this kind of legislation in the Maryland General Assembly is because of the presence of the tobacco lobbyists down there. Now, you have to remember the tobacco industry is against this sort of thing because you know, this might cost them a penny or two, you know, that is or, or a few dollars. Yeah. And so they have lobbyists that are living down there during the whole en entire Maryland General right. Assembly session. They come to all the hearings. They testify against these bills and so on. They throw out nebulous stuff, which is yeah. just nothing but a bunch of right. trash. But they're also, in my opinion, buying off uh, quite a few of the legislators down there. Yes, uh, it's really an unfortunate situation. Yeah. I think... Uh, that our viewers now have a good understanding of the nature of this problem and I hope that they will be able to do something in their own localities to further smoke-free air in multi-unit housing. Thank, Thank you. you.